Have you ever wondered, like, how can I win against sin, especially the sin that I actually like. I don't like it like it, but I like to do it. I, I indulge in it because it's what I've done. It's a bad habit thing that I have stuck in. And how do I get out of this quagmire, this quicksand of sin and doing the thing that I wish I wasn't doing? Well, good, for, good news for you and good news for me, good news for all of us. God showed us how to win against sin. And that's what we're going to look at today from Romans chapter number six. Romans 6, 12 says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. One of the most misunderstood passages in the entire Bible when it says you're not under the law, but under grace. But what it says, first of all, It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. What does that tell me? That tells me if sin is reigning, reign, R-E-I-G-N, not reigning like it's reigning outside, let not sin therefore reign or have rule over your mortal body, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. What is it implying? It's implying a couple things. Number one, that if sin reigns in your body, it's reigning in your body because you let it. Who let it? Everybody type yourself on the chest, say, I let it. That's right. So if it rains, if sin reigns in me, it reigns in me because I let it rain. If a bad attitude reigns in me, it reigns in me because I let that bad attitude rule over me. And the reason we're not supposed to let sin rule over us is because the only thing that's supposed to rule over us is God. That's what the whole seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness thing means. It means that I am seeking for God to rule as a sovereign king over this life that is Myron Golden, And then I yield my life to God as a sovereign king of my life. And then he gives me an assignment to rule over as a sovereign king of that assignment. I use that assignment that I rule over to serve the people I come in contact with. So let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof means that if sin reigns in your body, it reigns in your body because you let it reign in your body. So you have control. Who has control? Everybody tap yourself on the chest say, I have control. You have control because sin shouldn't reign. Why? Because you shouldn't let it reign. Now, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it and lust thereof. Here's what else that shows us. It shows us that whoever rules your life is who you obey. So you can talk about obeying God, but if sin's ruling, that's not who you're obeying. That's not who you're yielded to. You are yielded to the one you obey. If you obey to God, then you're yielded to God. If you obey to sin, then you're yielded to sin. So the scripture says clearly, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let it rule over your mortal body that you should obey it and lust thereof. And then it says, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, verse 13, neither neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So here's what that's saying. It's saying, don't yield your members. What's a member? My eyes are members of my body. So I don't yield my eyes to look at things that the scripture tells me I should not look at. Oh, I get it. I yield my ears. What does that mean? That means I'm not listening to things that the scripture says I shouldn't listen to. Does the scripture say I shouldn't look at things? Does the scripture say I shouldn't listen? It does. I'll show you that in a minute. And then it says, uh, my hands are members. I don't yield my hands to do things that God tells me I should not do with my hands, right? And then I heal my feet so that I don't tread on paths that the scripture tells me I shouldn't tread on. I'm yielding my members. I'm not making myself do the right thing. I'm just yielding myself to the right one. See, I'm just doing my own thing. You don't have a thing to do. You're either doing God's thing or you're doing the enemy's thing. You say, what enemy? Either the world, the flesh, or the devil. So let's clarify that. The world is one, like there are three temptations. There are three enemies that tempt us in three different ways. One temp enemy, Temptation is the world. And the, when I say the world, I'm not talking about the earth, the ball that's spitting around the sun. Um, I'm talking about the world system, the cosmos, the order, the world's way of doing things, the way the world, the people around, the peer pressure way, the cultural, the earth cultural way, the Hollywood way, the movie scene way, the music, the magazine. I'm not doing things the way that people on the earth think they should be done. That's the world. See, the world affects me in my ambition, and it's my desire to be somebody. When I say my desire to be somebody, I mean worldly temptations are the temptations that we have when we feel the need for other people to believe something about us. That is the temptation of the world. Are y'all tracking? So I need you to think I'm smart. That temptation is a temptation of the world, right? I need to fit in. I want to go along to get along. That's a temptation of the world. I want to sign the banana and be one of the bunch. That is a worldly temptation. Okay. 
The world, that's one temptation. The world tempts me in my ambitions, my desire to be somebody. The flesh tempts me in my appetite and my desire to feel something. By the way, I believe that the temptations of the flesh a lot of times are erroneously temp- uh, attributed to the temptations of the devil. I'm going to get to the devil in a minute. Uh, but the world, the temptations of the flesh are my temptation, my desire to feel something. And whether that desire to feel like something good tastes good in my mouth, whether I want to feel something that like, by the way, there's nothing wrong with feeling good as long as you're not doing something that you shouldn't do in order to have that good feeling. For, I'm, I'm going to give you a perfect for instance. There's nothing wrong with eating. Food is good. I like food. There is something wrong with eating too much, right? I love the fact that the Bible doesn't tell us how to eat necessarily. It doesn't say eat healthy, right? It doesn't say go eat healthy. But it does tell us what to eat, what not to eat, and why we should eat and why we shouldn't eat. In fact, there's a verse. Here's, here's a really interesting verse in the book of Ecclesiastes. Here's what it says. It says, um, Blessed art thou, O land, whose princes eat for strength and not for drunkenness. Eat for drunkenness? Drunkenness, what, is, what does that word drunken mean? It means excess. They're not eating for excess. Food is Satan's secret weapon. I, I don't have, I don't, I'm not going to go into that right now because I don't have time because I already did a video on it. Go watch the video on Satan's secret weapon. It'll explain it. I'll break that whole thing down for you. So my temptation to feel something. There's nothing wrong with sex. Sex is great. It's really a wonderful, one of God's greatest inventions. But he created some parameters. Husband and wife. If you're not having sex with your husband, ladies, or your wife, men, and I said that that way on purpose. It's a, it's a fleshly temptation. And you're yielding to the flesh to feel something you have no right to feel because you haven't done the thing that God says is right in order for you to feel it. The appetite itself is not bad. It's how we satisfy the appetite that's bad or good. Y'all track it. Sleep. There's nothing that feels better than sleep when you're tired. But the scripture tells me not to sleep too much. Love not sleep lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. A little sleep, a little fo- slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. Sleep will rob you of opportunities that you missed while you were snoring. The Bible warns us. Now, sleep is fine. Love and sleep is not fine. Why? Because your flesh is your enemy. Never overindulge the flesh because the more you feed it, the hungrier it gets. The hungrier it gets. That's temptation of flesh. What's the temptation of the devil? Tempta- so the, the world tempts us in our ambitions, our desire to be somebody. Uh, the flesh tempts us in our, in our appetites, our desire to feel something. And the devil tempts us in our attitudes, our desire to be over other people, to lord over, rule over, use other people, mistreat other people. Like you got a bad attitude, you are influenced by Satan. You think you're better than somebody? You're being influenced by Satan. What is the, tem- what is the, what is the, the, what is the snare and the temptation of the devil? The temptation of the devil was he thought he could be higher than God. And when you're tempted in your attitude, you're tempted to think you're better than somebody. But I'm so glad God told me how to measure whether or not I am falling into satanic sin. Now, there are other things other than this, but this is one of the most important things. I'm going to tell you something God says, this, the, the scripture says. How you treat people, this is what God talking now. How you treat people is how you treat me. I know I said that too fast. How, how you treat people is how you treat me. How can you say you love God whom you have not seen if you hate your brother whom you have seen? What does that mean? How you treat people is how you treat me. No, I, no, 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 no. I, 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 I get it, but I just want you to know how this works now. Then he took it a step further. How you treat people who have nothing to offer you is how you treat me. It's easy to treat people good if you know you're about to close the deal. Mm, I wish I had some help in here. It's easy to treat people good when you think they're going to invite you to their party in their mansion on the hilltop. It's easy to treat people good if you think they're going to give you a job or they control your paycheck. But what about the homeless person? What about the server at the restaurant? What about the flight attendant on the airplane? What about the person that, what about the person that, has, you, that has nothing to offer you? Jesus said, well, you know, here's where, here's where you messed up. He said, uh, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked, you didn't give me any clothes. He said, uh, he said I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was sick, you didn't minister unto me. They said, well, when did we do all that? Here's what he said. And as much as you've done it unto the least of these, who are the least of these? The people who have nothing to offer you. And as much as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it also unto me. It's easy to treat people good who have the ability to give you money and notoriety and popularity and fame. How do you treat the people who have nothing to offer you? That's how you treat God. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but alive unto God. Uh, But yield your members, your eyes, your mind, your mouth to speak words, pure words. 
your ears to listen to pure thoughts or pure words, your hands to do good deeds, your feet to, tr- your feet to trod good paths. Yield your in- members as instruments of righteousness unto God, as those that are alive from the dead. And then it says this in verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, if you do these things, sin won't have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, most people mistakenly think that means that God doesn't care whether or not we keep the law. The law is for the Old Testament. Well, the law is, God ain't changed. Now, ceremonial laws have changed. I don't don't have time to go into all the reasons, but ceremonial laws have changed. Okay, if this is the law, And this is you. Why are you so sad? Because I am a sinner. And the law says, you are a sinner. You know what you say? You say, I know. That ain't news. I remember when I was in high school, uh, this guy, this kid that I went to school with, we were both into martial arts, and he says to me one day, he said, man, I want to ask you a question. I said, sure, what's up? He said, if you died today, you know for sure you go to heaven? I said, what? He said, if you died today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? I said, I know if I died today, I wouldn't go to heaven. Now, if you'd ask me that, the answer would be, I know. Heaven? What heaven going to do with me? No, I ain't going to heaven. I'm just keeping it real. I, I wasn't confused. I knew I wasn't good. I wasn't even trying to fake the funk. I knew I wasn't good, right? And so I, I, I said, I know. And then the law says, you better get right. And then you know what you say? <laughs> but I can't. You know why? Because my flesh likes sin. Did y'all hear what I just said? In fact, likes it so much, it's dedicated to it. Don't judge me, so is yours, right? And so what happens is I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. But before I came to Christ, I was under the law. And when I was under the law, I could not keep the things contained in the law. Why? Because my flesh had a law written in my members. So if you read Romans chapter 7, which we'll do a Bible study on that as well. But Romans chapter 7 talks about three different laws. And I'm going to do those for you really quickly. So there are three different laws that Romans 7 talks about. It talks about the law of the scriptures, which is from my master. So a lot of people don't understand Romans chapter 7 because they don't understand there are three different laws that are being mentioned in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, law number one. The first law that's mentioned, the law of the scripture, which is from my master. That's the first law. The second law it talks about is the law of sin, which is in my members, which means my, it's like sin is coded into my fleshliness, into my sinful nature. Like the sin nature is in my flesh. But then there's the law of the spirit, which is in my mind. But I only get that law after I receive Christ. That's the law of the spirit, which is in my mind. So when, and the law of the spirit, which is in my mind, is a gift that comes from God because I receive the Holy Spirit when I come to Christ. When I receive Christ as my Savior, I also receive the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of of people think you receive it later because in the book of Acts, they received it later. They received it later in the book of Acts because they were in a transitional dispensation. How do I know that when a person receives Christ, they also receive the Holy Spirit? Here's how I know. Because the scripture says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Which means if I have the spirit of Christ, if I have Christ, I have the spirit of Christ. And if I don't have the spirit of Christ, I don't have Christ. I'm not under the law. I mean, I'm not, a, it says for you're not under the law, under, sin shall not have dominion over you. What? You're not under the law, is under it. Who's he writing this to? He's writing this to the church at Rome. These are believers he's writing this to. These are people who've already received the gift of salvation, which is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not some religious activity. Okay, y'all track it. Okay, here's what we know from Matthew chapter 5. Grace is higher than the law. I did this so wrong, and hopefully it'll move this time. We're going to do it like this. Grace is here. Grace is here. The law is here. And I am here. And the law says, you're a sinner, and I said, I know. The law says, you better get right. I said, I can't. The law says you're going to go to hell. I said, I know. And then, but I can't do nothing about it. Why? Because the law of sin is in my members. Watch this. When I receive Christ as Savior, I get transformed and transplanted. And what happens is God moves me from down there to up here. Now, here's what happened. What do you, what do you mean? When I receive Christ, I'm no longer under the law but under grace. Here's what, how, how do I know that? Matthew chapter 5 says, You've heard that it had been said by them of old times that thou shalt not commit adultery. 
But I say unto you, what? Whoso looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So in the dispensation of grace, grace takes you further than the law. It does not bring you up short of the law. It takes you further than the law. Why? Because when you were under the law, you had neither the power nor the desire to do the things contained in the law. You, had, you didn't have the power. That's the dynamic. You did not have the uh, desire. That, I mean, you didn't have the, that's the passion. So I had, neither the, I had neither the power nor the passion neither the desire nor the dynamic to do the things contained in the law. Contained in the law. But when I received Christ, I was transformed. How was I transformed? I was transformed according to the words of Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Here's what it says. For it is God. It's who? God that worketh in you. Worketh where? In who? You. Who used to work? When you were down here, who worked in you? Sin worked in you. Now that you've been moved, you're no longer under law but under grace. It is God that worketh in you both to will, that's the desire, that's the passion, and to do, that's the dynamic and the desire to do his good pleasure. When God, when, when, when Jesus saved you, God gave you by the power of the Holy Spirit. We know this by, according to Romans chapter 8, that he that raised up Christ from the dead, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal body, which was dead in sin before, shall make alive or your, bo- your mortal body um, when you walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a different YouTube video on that. I'm going to do a different YouTube video. On that. But just understand, when you come to Christ, for the first time in your life, oops, for the first time in your life, you have both the power and the passion to please God. You had neither when you were down here. Up here, you have both. So now, because you have the desire and the power, this is what you look like now. Why? Because now I have the passion and the power. I have the desire and the dynamic to do the things contained in the word of God. Why? Because when you come to Christ, it is God working in you through his spirit that gives you the ability to do the things that please God. When you were under the law, you had neither the desire nor the power. But now that you're not under the law, but you're under grace, you have both the desire and the power to do the things contained in the law. Isn't that beautiful? Wait till I show you. Now, I told you that this is what happens. Wait till we show you on a different Bible study how it happens, how to actually activate this. It's going to blow your mind. In the meantime, in between time, go look at the verses that we showed you. Go read Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8. And like, just let that marinate into your spirit. Because when you do, I promise you, you're going to be blown away. Also, another, like, go read the book of Galatians. It'll, it also breaks it down in Galatians chapter 5. It talks about if you do this one thing, you don't have to worry about these other 19 things. See, when we are, when we are born, we're born into sin. A man that is born of a woman is few days old and full of trouble. Wow. Why? Because, because we have sin in our nature, because we are the descendants of Adam. We are the descendants of the first Adam. But when we come to Christ, our DNA gets regenerated. We become descendants of the second Adam. If for, wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And then the scripture says, if by one man were many made sinners, then by the death of one man shall many be made righteous. Isn't it beautiful? He doesn't just tell us what to do. He shows us how to do it. And this is how we begin to win against the enemy of sin. Stay blessed by the best. Thanks, my people.